Palmolive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks teaches English at Madison High. Well, like many other romantically inclined people, she sent the object of her affections, Madison's bashful biologist, Philip Boynton, an unsigned card for Valentine's Day. And then she sat down to wait for his reply. It wasn't that his reply was long in coming. It just didn't come at all. <laughs> Knowing Mr. Boynton, I wasn't too surprised that he forgot about Valentine's Day, but I was determined to change the locale of our next date. For the past six weeks, we had spent every Friday afternoon at the zoo. Now, I am definitely not anti-animal, but I am a school teacher, and hence, after spending three hours in the monkey house, I just can't afford to buy taboo by the court. <laughs> I was brooding about it in the school cafeteria on Friday when Harriet Conklin walked over. Mind if I sit down with you, Miss Brooks? Not at all, Harriet. But don't you usually have lunch with Walter Denton? Oh, yes, I do. But he's manager of the basketball team, you know, and he's giving the boys an extra skull practice. Really? Whose skull are they using today? <laughs> I hope you're not expecting Mr. Boynton to have lunch with you, Miss Brooks. He told me he was eating his lunch in the laboratory because he didn't want to leave McDougal alone. Oh, don't tell me that frog is sick again. Oh, not actually sick. It's just spring fever or something. It's kind of fun to have lunch without any men around anyway. Don't you think so, Miss Brooks? Well, yes and no. What do you mean, yes and no? No. <laughs> had a real woman-to-woman -woman talk in a long time. You know, Walter Denton is crazier about me than ever. All I have to do is whistle and he comes running. Really? It's the only way to train them. That's what you ought to try with Mr. Boynton. I have, but every time I whistle, he opens his lunchbox. <laughs> Sometimes his dog-like affection and constant worship becomes absolutely cloying. Well, I wish Mr. Boynton would cloy me once in a while. <laughs> By the way, Harriet, when Walter takes you out on a date, where do you usually go? Oh, all sorts of places, Miss Brooks. A drive in the country or, or a long walk in the park. Or sometimes we go to a movie and hold hands. Do you ever go to the zoo? The zoo? Oh, gosh, no. Except when Mr. Boynton takes us there for his monthly lecture. That's where I've got an edge on you kids. I hear it every week. <laughs> But Mr. Boynton takes you to the movies once in a while, doesn't he? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, we went last week. Was it romantic? Oh, extremely. We stood in a crowd of people behind a velvet rope for a while, and then an usher said, there's one down front. Yes? That was the last I saw of Mr. Boynton for three hours. <laughs> I finally got a seat in the balcony. Oh, golly, that's a shame, Miss Brooks. You couldn't hold hands at all, could you? Not even with the long gloves I was wearing. <laughs> but about those Fridays in the monkey house, Harriet... I'm it... surprised at you, Miss Brooks. You don't really let Mr. Boynton take you to the monkey house every week, do you? Well, I think it's the monkey house. It can't be the Taj Mahal with all those bananas. Uh... <laughs> well, well, if it isn't Madison High's Ferris, may I join this charming bevy of pulchritude? Why, Walter, what a lovely speech. Yes, you are a delightful child, Walter. But if you'll excuse me, Miss Brooks, I'd like to get my entree at the steam table. Oh, can I be of service, Fair Harriet? I'll gladly fetch what you want. No, thank you. But if you'll sit up nicely when I return, I'll pat you on the head. Arf, arf. <laughs> can I get you anything, Miss Brooks? No, thanks, Harriet. Just bring back a roast beef bone and a can of strong heart. <laughs> okay, Harriet. You know, I think it's wonderful the way you kids get along. You're very fond of Harriet, aren't you, Walter? Very. A plus which Harriet's the principal's daughter and I'm manager of the basketball team. And there are things that I can accomplish quicker if I can get to Mr. Conklin without having to go through regulation channels all the time. What's good about getting to Mr. Conklin so fast? Well, I like getting things done fast that need getting done fast. Uh, like New Jersey's, for instance. Like New Jersey's what, for instance? <laughs> Not New Jersey's anything. New jerseys for the basketball team. Oh, we need them badly. You do at that. The ones the team wore in their last game looked awfully fuzzy. They didn't wear any in their last game. <laughs> but I'm sure the new ones will come through all right. 
I'm taking Harriet out on a date tonight, and I can bring it up casually when I see Mr. Conklin at his house. I don't like to suggest a career for you, Walter, but I have a feeling you're going to kiss an awful lot of babies before you're much older. <laughs> oh, I could never be a politician. I'm too sincere. Oh, but why are we talking about me? You seem to have a problem of your own on your mind, Miss Brooks. Is it that obvious, Walter? I have been thinking about Mr. Boynton, but only in connection with getting him out of the zoo and into my parlor. Hmm, that shouldn't be too tough. What kind of a web are you spinning? Web? Look, Miss Brooks, at the risk of feeling like a traitor to a fellow male, I'll help you plot Mr. Boynton's overthrow. But frankly, I'm kind of hungry right now. Then why don't you eat, Walter, and we can finish building the bomb after lunch? <laughs> oh, say, there's Mr. LeBlanche, the new French teacher. Oh, he ought to know plenty about romance. He's a real Frenchman. I'll call him over. Don't and... you dare, Walter. When I'm ready to take my case to the United Nations, I'll let you know. <laughs> Besides, I've seen Mr. LeBlanc on dates with Miss Enright lately. So what? Miss Enright goes on dates with anybody. Gosh, every time she sees Mr. Boynton, she makes goo-goo eyes at him. That's not nice, Walter. Miss Enright's eyes are always that way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's unethical. Unethical is better than lonesome, Miss Brooks. Oh, Mr. LeBlanc. Walter, please. You I... call me Walter? Yes. Would you be kind enough to come over here a minute? I'd like to talk to you about something very important. Well, you better talk to him, anyway, Walter, because I refuse I to... I bring my coffee along and... Oh... How do you, Miss Brooks? Fine. How do you, Mr. LeBlanc? <laughs> what, uh, what did you want to talk to me about, Walter? Oh, it isn't important. I'll see you later. Now, that's what I call a real subtle maneuver. <laughs> he's, a, he's a funny boy, no? No. <laughs> well, now, now he's just you and I, Miss Brooks, eh? I'm afraid he's just you, Mr. LeBlanc. I've got to see Mr. Conklin about something. Mr. Conklin, please, Miss Brooks, I think Mr. Conklin is a fine principal, but do you have to mention him during the lunch period? <laughs> You've got something there. I guess it can wait a while. It's only a question of giving him my weekly dollar. Oh, you owe him a weekly dollar? For what? It's a long and grim story, but I think I can boil it down to the repulsive essentials. A couple of weeks ago, I took an electric heater of his, connected it in Mr. Boynton's laboratory on an overloaded circuit, and shorted the building, started a small fire, and ruined the heater. Why do you do that? I like sirens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't do it purposely, Mr. LeBlanc. It was an accident, one for which I'm paying at the rate of a dollar a week. And today's dollar day at Madison. <laughs> well, that is too bad, Miss Brooks, but it is not money that causes you to look the way you do today. Is there a sign on my forehead? How do I look today? Well, there are only two things that can make a woman have the look you have on your face. Uh, one is an affair of the heart. The other is the meatballs in this cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> but, but neither of them is insurable, eh? I'm sure. You haven't eaten those meatballs lately. <laughs> look, it's nice of you to try and cheer me up, Mr. LeBlanc. Oh, please, but... call me Paul. And I'm not trying to cheer you up. I'm trying to help you. First of all, tell me this. Did you receive any messages on Valentine's Day? Oh, scared. I got one from Zimmerman's Bakery, one from the finance company, a lovely little card from Bertie's Bicycle Shop, in the shape of a pump, that one was. <laughs> and, uh, oh, yes, a dandy little poem from Sam, our neighborhood scissor sharpener. I think I remember that one. It went, uh, I've applied my grindstone to shears both old and new, but I never met a scissors one half as sharp as you. <laughs> Isn't that a peachy sentiment for Valentine's Day? Oh, uh, quite amusing, yes. But not to you, I'm afraid. Because you're not in love with Sam the Scissor or Bertie the Bicycle. No, my problem is Boynton the Biology. <laughs> Miss Wook, since we have taken me into your confidence, I would like to make a suggestion. You must play... How do you say in this country? Uh, uh, you must play difficult to acquire. Difficult to acquire? Ah. Oh, you mean hard to get. Mm. Uh -huh. Precisely, Miss <laughs> Now, tell me. Tell me the truth. When Mr. Boynton asks you for an engagement, do you ever say no? Well, no. But it isn't just because of Mr. Boynton. I'd hate to disappoint 400 monkeys. <laughs> that is, I haven't gone out with him much lately at all. Because he do not ask you? Well, I like that. I am glad. Miss Brooks, there's one way to get a man interested that never fails. You must make him gel out. <laughs> that, Mr. LeBlanc, but he just, just doesn't gel out very easily. 
Ah, yes, but you've tried it only once. That is not enough. How do the big American advertisings work? A repetition over and over the same thing. What is it you hear on the radio all the time? Smoke a penny. <laughs> Get him again. Smoke a penny. <laughs> if you repeat this often enough, do you know what happens? Yeah, Jack gets pretty burned out. <laughs> no, Mr. LeBlanc, I'm afraid Mr. Boynton is too wrapped up in a frog to pay any attention to me. Oh, but of course, I forget Monsieur Le Frog. You know, in France, we have a proverb. Le chemin au cœur d'homme et par son grinelle. Translation, the way to a man's heart is through his frog. <laughs> I don't see what it has oh, to do. Oh, it's so with... simple, really. Here you have a man with his little pet, Monsieur Le Frog. And here you have a woman with her pet, Mademoiselle La Frog. Now, we convince the man that Monsieur Le Frog is lonesome. And where can his poor little frog find companionship? With Mademoiselle La Frog. And when the two little frogs are together, where are the man and the woman? Pricing junior beds for tadpoles. <laughs> No, no, Miss Books, no. The man and the woman are also together. Now you know, Miss Books, what you have to do to get Mr. Boynton to be a bath to your door. No? Yes, I've got to build a better frog trap. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Mr. Le Frog, uh, LeBlanc. <laughs> this idea is oh, a little I'm impractical. coming, Miss Brooks. Oh, you look better already. Hello, Walter. Mr. LeBlanc is quite an idea man. <laughs> we were just discussing a really fantastic scheme. Not only fantastic, but ridiculous and absurd. Walter. Yes, Miss Brooks? Run down to Peterson's pet shop and get me a female frog. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. The makers of Palm Olive Soap are giving away $100,000 in prizes. First prize, $49,000, plus over 4,900 other cash prizes in the big 49 Gold Rush Contest. Hundreds will strike it rich in this exciting Gold Rush Contest. One of them may be you. It's easy to enter. Just finish this sentence in 25 additional words or less. I like palm olive soap because... That's all. Just 25 words or less to finish the sentence, I like palm olive soap because... Then mail your entry right away along with a palm olive soap wrapper. Try for your share of that $100,000 in prizes right now. Your chance of winning $49,000 is as good as anyone. Get entry blank with complete rules from your dealer or write your completed sentence on plain paper. Include your name and address and dealer's name and address. Mail with one palm olive soap wrapper for each entry to Gold Rush Contest, Box 49, New York 8, New York. Better write that down. Gold Rush Contest, Box 49, New York 8, New York. Enter as often as you like, including one wrapper with each entry. Get palm olive soap right away to help win a lovelier complexion and try for your share of the $100,000 in cash prizes. Well, I gave Walter my last dollar to buy a female frog, and while he was out getting it, I took advantage of a free period to visit Mr. Boynton in his laboratory. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. I just dropped in to say hello, Mr. Boynton. Hello. Well, goodbye, Mr. Boynton. <laughs> oh, don't go yet. I've just been examining McDougal. You know, my frog. He's got me a little worried. He's way off his feet, and we'll, we'll look at him. <laughs> <laughs> don't you think his eyes pop out more than usual? What did you say? I, I said, don't you think his eyes pop out more than usual? Yes. For a minute, I thought he was Eddie Cantor. <laughs> Hi, Mac. Mm. Of course, you know what's wrong with Mac, don't you? Uh, no, Miss Brooks, I don't. Well, it's getting very close to spring, and it's just... After all, you raised him from a tadpole, and it's only natural that you should still think of him as your baby, but he's a big boy now. <laughs> what do you mean, Miss Brooks? Well, just this, Mr. Boynton. Did it ever occur to you that Mac gets lonesome all alone in that cage? Oh, I let him out of the cage quite often. He hops all over the lab. But what good is that? He hasn't got any friends here. Oh, I don't know. There are always a number of guinea pigs around. Of course, he doesn't pay much attention to them. Well, naturally, guinea pigs make fine friends for other guinea pigs. A frog might crave a different kind of companionship. Well, what about me? I'm very close to McDougal. I've been his constant companion. If I were a frog, I don't think I'd consider that the ideal arrangement either. No, I think I'd want something a little more frog-like. 
But just, what are you getting at, Miss Brooks? Look, did you ever sit down and tell McDougal about the birds and bees? Well, what does he want with birds and bees? He won't even make friends with guinea pigs. <laughs> put it this way. Mrs. Davis, my landlady, has a cat named Minerva. Now, around this time of the year, Minerva keeps us both awake half the night with an almost incessant yowling. Or have you tried giving her a saucer of milk? That's not what she's yowling about, Mr. Barnum. <laughs> <laughs> Milk's very effective with a cat, usually. Yes, I know. And believe me, if I thought it would quiet her down, I'd give her an autographed picture of Elsie the cow. But it won't. She's yowling because she's lonely. Why, Miss Brooks, I didn't know you were so aware of these biological manifestations. Where did you learn all this? My mama done told me. <laughs> I mean, I found out about a lot of things since, since I've acquired my pet frog. Pet female frog, that is. Oh, you have a pet frog, Miss Brooks? What's her name? Her name? Uh, Millie. Millie? Yes, from the picture of the mating of Millie. <laughs> oh, she's awfully cute, too. <laughs> Well, you think Mac almost understood what you were talking about. Well, don't think for a minute he doesn't. What do you say, Mac? Would you like to come over and play with Millie this afternoon? <laughs> Hooray! Today you are a man, Frog. Well, this is amazing, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Look, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you if... Uh, uh, shine up your hope chest, Millie. Here it comes. <laughs> I'd like to ask you, Miss Brooks, uh, how about a, a double date? That is, if you... Well, if it isn't too much trouble. Shall we say my place for tea? Splendid. Just bring a pogo stick and a deck of cards, Mr. Barnum. A pogo stick and cards? Yes, while Mac and Millie play gin, you and I can have a hopping contest. <laughs> oh, l'amour, l'amour. Excuse me, uh, could you come over here to the door a minute, Miss Brooks? I've got to get to my next class. Oh, certainly, Walter. I'll just be a minute, Mr. Barnum. Did you get it, Walter? Yes, it's in this paper bag, Miss Brooks. Here. Thanks. That's okay. I hope it works, Miss Brooks. Well, I'll see you in English. What's in the bag, Miss Brooks? This bag? Oh, just a roast beef sandwich Walter brought me. Well, it's a pretty active one. Hey, look out, it's falling out of the bag. Uh, here, here, let me see that. Uh, yeah, I've got him. Uh, oh, Miss Brooks, do you realize what you've got here? Sure, an F-R-O-G. I didn't want to mention it in front of Mac until we got home. Oh, but this I... is a male frog. You, you can always tell. Because in the species Dimorphognathus from West Africa, there's a very apparent dimorphism in the dentition. The male's being provided with a series of large serrated teeth in the lower jaw, which in the female is edentulous. Well, slap me with a wet lily pad. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Boynton, I've got to be running along now. Oh, why, Miss Brooks? I've got to see a boy about a frog. Well, here, here, I'll put it back in the bag for you. Now, just hold the top tighter and he won't get away again. I still don't comprehend why you got this male frog. Well, I didn't know how you and McDougal would react to the idea of keeping Millie company, so I thought I'd play safe and get this one, too. Ooh, ooh. Oh, I don't think Mac likes the idea very much. Uh, don't be jealous, Mac. Let him live his own life. <laughs> We'd better not come over this afternoon, Miss Brooks. I'm afraid it'd only confuse Mac. Look, Mr. Boynton, I don't care if a frog wants to play hard to get. But there's something I'd like you to remember. Well, what's that, Miss Brooks? Well, I don't want to sound too much like an English teacher, but when one plays hard to get too often, one sometimes don't get got. <laughs> I'll just take this frog into my room and see how Walter happened to make such well, an awful... Well, there you are, Connie. I've been looking all over for you. Mrs. Davis, what are you doing in the hallowed halls of Madison High? Well, I know how you've been waiting for a Valentine card from Mr. Boynton, and I just had to tell you that all hope isn't lost. But today is Friday, Mrs. Davis. That's just it, Connie. Some mail came this morning that should have been delivered Monday. A Valentine? No, a bill from the gas company. <laughs> now, that's the nicest bit of sentiment since Sam Scissors. <laughs> they say that if we don't pay it immediately, they'll shut off the gas. Just my luck with Mr. Boynton coming over for tea. It couldn't be the electric company promising to shut off all the lights. No, son. <laughs> and I'm short some money or I wouldn't bother you in school like this. You know, Minerva cost me a lot lately with her special diet No. Just how much do you need, Mrs. Davis? Well, if you'll forgive a slang expression, one greenback will do it. I just happen to have one on me. He's in this bag here. <laughs> now, don't look so alarmed, Mrs. Davis. I'm not cracking up completely. Look, just take this frog back to Peterson's Pet Shop and they'll refund my dollar. I'll explain why I bought the frog later. You don't have to explain anything to me, Connie. If you want a frog for a pet, it's perfectly all right. 
But why are you giving it back? To keep the gas on, for one thing. <laughs> Besides, it's a male frog, and I've got to have a female. Well, you don't have to spend any money for that. I'll get you a female frog in the park. I never thought of that. I'd certainly appreciate it, Mrs. Davis. Will you bring it back with you after you've paid the gas bill? Certainly, Connie. And I just know that you'll be very happy together. <laughs> And so, class, you are to have these compositions ready by next Tuesday. That's the end of the period. Class dismissed, except Walter Denton. Come up to my desk, Walter. Oh, I'm glad you asked me, Miss Brooks. I wanted to explain about that frog. You see, Mr. Peterson was out to lunch when I got to the pet shop, so I got you one out of the park pond. But was it all right? I mean, was she a girl? No, Walter, she was a boy with big serrated teeth in her lower jaw. And what about the dollar I gave you? Oh, here it is, Miss Brooks. <laughs> I didn't have time to give it to you before. Thanks, Walter. That'll be all for now, then. I'd better get over to Mr. Conklin's office and make my payment on that heater. Well, here I am, Connie. Hello, Walter. Hello, Mrs. Davis. Goodbye, Mrs. Davis. Well, what do you think, Connie? Mr. Peterson didn't sell Walter that frog at all. I know, Mrs. Davis. But he said it was a very good specimen and traded me a lovely female for him. And instead of giving us any money, he promised that when our frog becomes a husband, we'll get the pick of the litter. <laughs> I can hardly wait. But where's the female frog? Oh, I had that in a paper bag, and it seemed very insecure. So I put the frog in a desk across the hall. Nobody saw me. Across the hall? But that's Mr. Conklin's office. Mrs. Davis, you wait right here. And if I'm not back in five minutes, call the coroner. <laughs> Now, what is it? Come in. Oh, it's you, Miss Brooks. Please transact whatever business you have in this office in a hurry. I've got an appointment with the doctor. The doctor? What's the matter, Mr. Conklin? Oh, just a checkup. A lot of nonsense, if you ask me. My wife's been telling him all sorts of foolishness about the state of my nerves. To hear her tell it, I've not only got the world's highest blood pressure, but I'm jumpy, anxious, overwrought, irritable. Mr. Conklin... Don't interrupt! And I'm ill-tempered. <laughs> now, what is it you want? I just want to give you a dollar towards the heater I accidentally injured. Here. Oh, thanks. Well, sit down for a minute, and I'll give you a receipt. I've got a regular Board of Education receipt book around here somewhere. But, Mr. Conklin, your desk drawer... Please, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Don't tell me where I keep my things. Of course it's in the desk drawer. Let's see now. Book should be right over here next to this blotter. Oh, that's funny. That's it. Oh, here it is over by this frog. <laughs> Hello, little frog. <laughs> Miss Brooks, it won't take a moment to get the receipt. Hello, little frog! <laughs> <laughs> Miss Brooks, where did this monstrous... Do you know anything about this horrible creep? How did this Please, get in? Please, Mr. Conklin, remember the world's highest blood pressure. Never mind that. What is this frog doing in my desk? Calm down, Mr. Conklin. Ours isn't the only school that's overcrowded. <laughs> I thought you'd never get home from school, Connie. How long did Mr. Conklin spend bowling you out? Oh, it seemed like hours, but actually it was only a few minutes. You should have been there when Mr. Conklin and Millie here faced each other across his desk drawer. Poor thing, her heart hasn't stopped beating yet. Neither is yours, Connie. You're as jumpy as Minerva. Are you sure Mr. Boynton said he'd be over for tea? Oh, definitely, Mrs. Davis. I told him all about how lonely Minerva was and compared her to McDougal. So he's bringing Mac over to meet Millie. It's the first time in weeks we've had a date away from the zoo. Oh. Oh, that's Mr. Boynton now. I'll go make the tea, Connie, and you receive him alone. All right, Mrs. Davis, coming. Well, it's nice to see you boys. Come in. Let's go into the living room. Uh, thank you, Miss Brooks. Uh, here's something for Millie. It's from McDougal. Oh, I'll open it for her. Well, wasn't that thoughtful of Mac, Millie? Just what you needed, a clump of wilted lettuce. Here, I'll put it in this little box I keep her in. Uh. Oh, I guess Mac wants to see what Millie looks like. Oh, of course. Here, just hold him up. There we are. Uh, uh. This is Mac, Millie. Uh, uh, uh. I think she likes him, but Miss Brooks, didn't you say you had a cat on the premises? That's right, Minerva. She usually sleeps in the piano during the day. 
Here, Minerva, come out of the piano. Oh, well, she'll probably wake up in a little while. Sit down, Mr. Boynton. Oh, before I do, don't you want to open this big box? For me? Well, what in the world can this be? Yeah! It's a cat, Miss Brooks. <laughs> I brought him over to keep Minerva company. Yeah! Oh! Well, here comes Minerva now. Yeah! <laughs> they like each other, too. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Miss Brooks, Miss Brooks, where are you going? You know where I'm going. I'll meet you by the third monkey from the left. <laughs> Eve Orton, as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Only luster cream brings you K. Dumas magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster cream, not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanent. Four ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to. A luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Boynton finally took McDougal and his cat and left. Mrs. Davis and I had dinner, and then we sat down in the living room to spend a quiet evening. Minerva went back to sleep, and everything was nice and peaceful when the phone rang. <laughs> Lie down, Minerva. It's not for you. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Oh, I'm sorry, Minerva. It is for you. <laughs> Next week, tune into another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Parmalee Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Here's good shaving news. Three men out of every four can get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves with Palmolive Brushless Shaving Cream. This is not just a claim. Here's the proof. 1,297 men tried the Palmolive Brushless Way to Shave described on the tube. And no matter how they shaved before, three men out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Try Palmolive Brushless yourself. See if you don't get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves the proved Palmolive Brushless Way. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these stations. And be with us again next week at this time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.